If you're ill and you need medicine, you should be able to get it. But high costs can make this virtually impossible. Safe and affordable access to medicines is key to universal healthcare, and sadly, progress towards that goal has stalled. But maybe there's a new way. COVID-19 has shown us that different stakeholders can come together to find a fair solution to a global health problem. We've learned that ethics and solidarity can guide our path. That's why we've launched the Oslo Medicines Initiative, a new neutral partnership where governments and pharmaceutical companies can work together to improve access to effective, high-cost medicines. The new initiative is founded on three principles. Solidarity, because there's strength in numbers. All stakeholders, governments and private companies need to agree on how to make fair access a reality. Transparency, because we need to build trust. And that happens when decisions on costs and access to medicines are made openly. And sustainability, so that we can build ethical and sustainable health systems that will last for generations to come. Together with our partners, we'll be working to put the needs of patients first, expanding access and building a fairer future. A future where everyone has access to the medicines they need. Find out more on our website. Good morning, thank you for joining us. I'm Natasha Tsopardi Muscat, the Director for Country Health Policies and Systems at the WHO Regional Office for Europe in Copenhagen. And today we have a very exciting session ahead of us, which I will be moderating with the, the, my companion Orden Haga from the Norwegian Medicines Agency. And the first part of the session on the Oslo Medicines Initiative today will be entitled Improved Access to High Cost Novel Medicines from Theory to Reality. And the second panel will then be aptly titled The Mission Ahead, Exploring Emerging Ideas. We will have an interactive session. You are encouraged to use the Q&A in the chat and we shall also have some polling questions for you. I can't believe time really has flown. A year ago, we launched the Oslo Medicines Initiative, which is a collaboration between the WHO Regional Office for Europe and the Norwegian Ministry for Health and Care Services and the Norwegian Medicines Agency. And they do say time does go by very quickly when you're very busy and you're really enjoying what you're doing. And indeed, over the past months, we have had the opportunity to have a first round of consultation with member states and also non-state actors, representatives of patients and professionals, and also the industry. And we thank those who have engaged and who, has, who have given us proposals and feedback because this has been very informative. But of course, now we go into a higher gear, so to say. And in fact, just a few days ago, we had an important side event at our annual board meeting, the regional committee that focused on the achievements of the initiative so far, as well as tackling some of the burning issues that need to be addressed to go forward successfully. Autumn will also be very intense. We are planning a series of webinars where we will present a number of background technical papers that have been in the making over the past months. And we will dive into a second, more intense round of consultations where it is very important that we listen carefully to everyone and we try to establish that which is common between us to build a space where we can move forward together. The innovation about this initiative is the WHO has sought to create 
a neutral platform, a safe space where all stakeholders can express their views and can shape and contribute to move forward. We do not underestimate that this is a very complex task. We do know that the starting point has been that there has been lack of progress over the past years. But at the same time, the COVID pandemic has also shown where there is a will, there can be a way, and that the public and private sectors can collaborate to improve access more rapidly and also to make this available where it is needed at an affordable price. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the panel for the first part of the session. Dr. Hans Kluge, who needs no introduction, is the regional director of the WHO regional office for Europe and a strong promoter and supporter of this initiative because he listened firsthand to the asks from member states during his election campaign and access to medicines was one of the topics practically mentioned across the 53 countries. Dr. Bjorn Inge Larsen is a special representative for international health for the Norwegian Ministry of Health and Care Services, and throughout his career has been engaged in the debate on the role of civil society and the private sector in public health. And I'm sure that with his experience, we also have a safe pair of hands to contribute to taking this initiative forward. It's my pleasure also to introduce Elizabeth Kuiper. Elizabeth is the Executive Director of Public Affairs of the Europe European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry Associations, with whom we have started to engage in dialogue over the past months through the initiative and Sylvain Giroux, who is the head of unit responsible for medical products, quality, safety and innovation at the European Commission, DG Sante, again, a very important partner and also in view of the EU pharmaceutical strategy, which no doubt you will hear more about. But if I can move straight away to our first polling question, and if we can have this on the screen, what is the state of the relationship between industry, governments, and patients in relation to access to innovative medical products? And here you have four choices from a very optimistic, working well, to a very pessimistic, completely broken. Somewhere in between needs uh, needs to be improved and then if you really have no idea what is going on unclear to me which could be expected given the complexity of the medicines ecosystem ranging from unmet need research and development pricing and reimbursement regulation procurement authorization post-marketing vigilance so let's give some time for people to vote, perhaps another half a minute or so. If you are uncertain how to participate, please scan the QR code shown on the screen with your smartphone. Otherwise, follow the link, which is available in the chat. And what can we see? We can see that the moderates lead the way, which needs to be improved, with followed by completely broken, unclear to me, and a minority working well. Phew, we wouldn't have, I think, embarked on this initiative had we all been convinced that it was one that was working well. So I think it is really quite a fair assessment that we all acknowledge that the system needs to be improved. And I think that's a great starting point for our panel. And therefore, I would like first to hand the word to Dr. Hans Kluge. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Natasha. And good morning, good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. 
I must say that it's a pleasure again to join at the European Health Forum in Gastein, particularly on the Oslo Medicines Initiative, because it is with our partners from Norway that we did launch the initiative at the Gastein Forum exactly one year ago. So it's very timely to reflect what has happened and how can together we shape the way forward. You may remember that the initiative came at the right moment and became an important player in the global health landscape, shaped by, on the one hand, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is centered around universal health coverage, which in the pan-European region is mainly an issue of financial protection. The WHO Barcelona office has now data from 33 countries of the 53 in the pan-European region answering the question, can people still afford to pay for healthcare? And the data show that the proportion of households being pushed into poverty due to the fact that they can no longer afford innovative medicines for non-communicable, for chronic diseases, varies between 0.2% and 10.8% with a median of 2.7%. So something needs to be done. The initiative was also inspired by the 2019 World Health Assembly Resolution on the transparency of the markets for medicines, vaccines, and other health technologies. So transparency straight away, as we saw from the video clip, is one of the principles, and the two other ones are solidarity and sustainability. And what we want to do is to foster a open, very important constructive dialogue to more equal access to medicines, to move towards a sustainable, equal access for affordable novel medicines. The first year of the initiative was not so easy. I think we can, uh, this is a, a fact, because the ongoing pandemic of the COVID-19 really turned upside down the lives, how we live our lives, societies, and the whole way we think and work. But it also created opportunities, despite of the social distancing and the teleworking. If for anything, it made very clear the link between all inhabitants in the world, that going alone is no option. And that's, in fact, what we discussed also this morning with the president of Gastein, Dr. Clemens Ohr, and a number of colleagues at the press point on the need for a new multilateralism. The point I try to make is that, if anything, with the COVID-19, it is that it made the Oslo Medicines Initiative even more timely and relevant. Because despite of the obstacles, if you think, for example, for the COVID-19 vaccines, there's the economic downturn, disrupted supply chains, qualified workforce shortages, to, just to name a few. We also saw a positive wave in the collaboration between public and private sector. So if it's possible for COVID-19, it should be possible also for the rare diseases, for cancer and other life-threatening conditions. So in the past year, with the colleagues from Norway, the Oslo Medicines Initiative held consultations with member states, with non-state actors, and with the pharmaceutical industry. I myself, I was personally speaking with many stakeholders also in meetings, multilateral fora, and everybody agrees that the current system really needs to be improved. And I think that was right, Natasha, what we saw from the, the Slido. So agreeing on the problem is a good start, but obviously is not enough. Because as we say, the devil is in the details. So we must have all the components in place to make a transition to an improved collaborative model. 
My principle, and I know that Dr. Bjorn Inge Larsen shares the same principle, is to go for win-win-win situation. Especially a win for the patients. Remember the core of the Talent Charter? No one should become poor due to ill health, which was repeated in the Oslo recommendations of the two high-level meetings that we held with the Norwegian government in Oslo on the impact of the financial crisis on health and health systems. So we need two dimensions. We need a political dimension to create an environment conducive to success, and we need a technical dimension which will ensure implementation of the new collaborative agreements. Leadership is critically important here. And again, I would like to thank our partner and the co-founder of the Oslo Medicines Initiative, the government of Norway, for taking a lead in the high-level discussions with the member states to generate buy-in and ensure political support. We will do from our, our share, WHO Europe, as a neutral convener to support this dialogue and facilitate pilots of proposed solutions. But also through our technical capacity, and I want to thank Natasha, Sarah, the consultants, the team for this, for offering the expertise for reviewing pricing policies and frameworks, supporting capacity strengthening and institution strengthening. We feel without exaggeration, a very proud partner of the Oslo Medicines Initiative. Personally, for me, that's the reason why I decided to study for a medical doctor. To save lives and improve the quality of lives. So in, I would like to invite the governments, payers, civil society and the industry to come together and work together under the umbrella of the Oslo Medicines Initiative to make quality medicines, vaccines and other health technologies available and affordable for everybody who needs them. Leaving no country behind, leaving no individual behind is not a slogan. We have seen it is a collective duty of all of us. Thank you again for this opportunity and I hand back to the facilitator to take us to the next item of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Hans, particularly for showing how this initiative really fits within the wider vision and implementation plan of the WHO Regional Office for Europe. And of course, ending on that note that leaving no country, no individual behind is not a slogan. But can I come now to Dr. Bjorn Inge Larsen? Bjorn Inge, your experience from a member state perspective is very important. It has led you to really be an advocate for this initiative. So perhaps you can share with us what your uh, experience has been and what your expectations are, and also perhaps a rallying call for other member states who may not yet be feeling and sensing the situation as uh, well as Norway is. Of course, we know that Norway is a high income country. So for us at WHO, when Norway comes to us and says, this is a problem. For us, it is a problem that needs to be taken very, very seriously. And it could be that some countries are not even yet on the cusp of seeing what is ahead. But please, Bjorninge, we would love to hear more from you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Natasha, and thank you for your introduction and your hard work. Yes, you're right, Norway is a high income country. Uh, if you look at the OECD statistics, uh, I think it's only two countries globally that are spending more dollars in their health services uh, for their population than, than Norway. So we are a high spender. Um, we have mostly a public health uh, care sector with some elements of private services. And, and in our service, we are fully committed uh, to deliver all medicines, including innovative medicines to our citizens. Uh, we're currently spending uh, more than 10% of the GDP uh, in our health uh, sector. 
And despite this, despite being a high income country and despite spending uh, high funding, a uh, high proportion in the health sector, uh, the prices are so high on some of the new innovative medicines that last year we, um, we had to say no to introduction of more than 20% uh, of all the new drugs uh, that were coming and that we would like to uh, introduce in our health service. And, and the reason for that is, is uh, quite simply the, the price uh, of the medicines, even after negotiations with the industry. Uh, and this fact uh, that uh, also we in our country uh, are not able to provide these medicines to our patients. Um, to us, it's a sign that this is not uh, a well-functioning market. In the dialogue uh, on access to medicines, it's often very difficult to understand why access is not achieved. Both we as national authorities and the industry state clear interest in giving patients access. To us, the uh, problem of not having access for, for good medicines is, is not decreasing. And, and we are actually very surprised to see that the industry sees itself served with setting very high prices and reaching a more limited patient population. So we uh, believe there's re good reason to have a dialogue with the industry um, to hear their view on how to improve access especially to the novel effective medicines in, in different groups of countries, both in high income countries and also in other countries. In, in our perspective, medicines, pharmaceuticals are not ordinary commodities. There is a human right to health. And as governments, as countries, we have obligations towards our citizens to fulfill this right. It, it is our understanding that there is a responsibility, both on the side of the government and on the side of the industry, to achieve real access for patients that could benefit from a drug. Over the last decades, price level on these innovative high cost medicines have hindered patients access to many of the drugs. And if industry agrees with us, as we believe they do, uh, then there is a good reason for dialogue to achieve a common goal, securing access to effective medicines. On the other hand, if the industry is hesitant uh, to say that they bear a social responsibility for securing access to medicines, of course, that is an important signal to countries uh, that governments need to take note of. The Oslo Medicines Initiative was established uh, by the momentum created by the adoption of the transparency resolution from the World Health Assembly in 2019. We were encouraged to see the strong support for transparency resolution from member states. More transparency will give the different parties better information and may create more well-functioning markets. Even though some countries disassociated themselves from the resolution, and we respect that for several reasons, the adoption of the resolution still was a very strong signal that governments share a common problem, that patients are not getting access to medicines that they need. The potential health effect from new medicines is not fully utilized, and this leads, in our, in our perspective, to a loss of public health. We understand that this industry needs to be profitable and sustainable, but real access must be improved. Health is no commodity, not a commodity like any other. It would probably also be of interest for stakeholders if we agree to methods of measuring access. For instance, proportion of a patient group getting access to new treatments uh, and medicines. And the purpose would be to evaluate if countries and industry is living up to our responsibilities. The Oslo Medicines Initiative is a cooperation, uh, intends to be a cooperation between public and private sector to improve access 
to novel and high-priced medicine. And our common goal should be to bring therapies to patients who need them. There isn't much value in treatments that sit on the shelf. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you very much, Bjorn Inge. Indeed, there is no value in the medicine that sits on a shelf. We want our medicines to arrive to the patients, to the ones who need them most, in a timely manner. And I was delighted to hear that you believe that industry is willing to be a collaborative partner. Indeed, in the past months, we have started to engage in a closer dialogue. And it is therefore with pleasure that I now give the floor to Elizabeth Kuiper. Elizabeth, over to you. We are very much looking forward to hearing the industry perspective. Well, many thanks, uh, Natasha, and good morning to all of you. You. It's really a delight to be here this morning, although I'm sure that we'd really like to catch up at some point to see each other face to face in the Gastein Valley. Um, but it's really important, as you said, and therefore it's so important to have this panel a year after the official launch of the Oslo and Medicines Initiative. And as you might recall, FPO was very happy to be involved from the very start last year. Because as was said before, and I think Hans was really to the point when he said that going alone is not an option. For us as an industry, achieving access to medicines for all patients that need them is really a joint ambition of the industry and society. Because we see, and, and even nowadays with COVID-19, that the industry's R&D pipeline is highly innovative. Really, there are a lot of many breakthrough innovatives uh, and, and therapies on the way. But when the most fantastic innovation doesn't reach patients and it remains on the shelf, it's of no use. So therefore, we really welcome the Oslo Medicines Initiatives as an opportunity to have this in-depth discussion on how we really can improve access to, to medicines in Europe for member states and stakeholders. And I think for that reason, it's important to know that we as FPA and other stakeholders also convened in the European Health Coalition have been calling for a high-level forum because again, as an industry, we are keen to contribute to access solutions, but we need a forum. And therefore, it's also important that the European Commission is involved in the discussion. And also in the panel afterwards, of course, it's really important to have the Commission around the table. As in, in our opinion, it is important to, to link the discussions that we're having today and in the context of the Oslo Medicines Initiative, also to the European pharmaceutical strategy. I think when it comes to finding joint solutions to improve access in Europe, the first task at hand should be really to understand the situation at a detailed level. Because access to medicines varies a lot between different countries in the European region for a large number of reasons. And really the situation can also vary across different products or classes of medicines. So we really also need to separate between the medicines being available in principle in a country and all patients actually having access to it, because even these might not always be the same. So for that reason, we need to develop more detailed information on data on access to medicines in the region. And of course, then the question is, what, what have you done as FPI, as, as an industry? And for that reason, we have been uh, working on our yearly weight report that really shows the difference in access between different parts of Europe and between different member states. And it's really appalling if you learn the differences between different countries. So it takes 120 days in Germany before a product comes to the market, whereas in Romania, it takes over 883 days. And again, that shows you that the problem at hand is a problem that really needs solutions. So therefore, we also have worked on a different report, which is really about what are then the root causes of these access problems. And really, we are currently also exploring how to bring together even more detailed data sets that can be made available, so that again, we can bring these pieces to the table as a joint effort to create more transparency in this regard. I think it's really important, and I'm sure that also in the Q&A session, we'll go into more detail and to more depth also on the three issues that we've been saying are of importance to the initiative. But I think it's really important that indeed no one stake or in isolation can improve the situation. Everyone needs to come to the table and there is really no silver bullet. So from the side of industry, as I tried to, to explain before, one of our responsibilities is really to better explain how access conditions in different countries affect 
decision making in companies, including how we launch as companies products in different countries and how that then indeed can be explained where there's extra problems. So I think that is really what we as an industry underline from our side. But we only really can unite behind the joint ambition to improve access to innovative uh, medicines in Europe and agree that innovation cannot stay on the shelf and needs to read patients. And that's again, what I'm very keen to discuss later during this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, also for sharing some of the initiatives that industry has been taking and for um, reiterating the importance of having a forum where the discussions that need to take place are able to do so. And now I would like to give the floor to Sylvain Giraud. The EU is definitely a very important partner for us as WHO Euro on this initiative, even though we represent 53 countries, including a number of non-EU countries. So I would like to now give the floor to you to explain a little bit the perspective of the EU and to hear from you also how uh, the EU and DG Sante see their role in this initiative. Over to you, Sultan. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to, for inviting me to join this, um, this panel and, and to share with you also some views on uh, the, the objectives uh, of the Oslo Medicine Initiative, which is very similar to the approach we are taking um, through what is the what we call the Europe, the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe, which is already referred to. It's a commission policy paper which was adopted in uh, November 2020 and which sets the way forward for uh, through the different uh, type of uh, policy instruments that we have available within the specific context of the European Union, sets the way forward how we're going to use those instruments to achieve a certain number of objectives. And where, where it, it is very close to uh, the spirit of the Oslo Medicines Initiative, it, has, it, is, also, it is similarly uh, built around the same um, uh, objectives, uh, what we sometimes have been, have been called the three A's of, for accessibility or access, affordability and availability. We also have a strong focus in this document on issues relating to quality and safety. Uh, as uh, as you know well, uh, this is also the core objective of the EU legislation um, in, 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 in the context of the EU internal market. So th those are uh, very important objectives and uh, we're trying to pursue them in coordination. We believe indeed, and this is the holistic approach we're taking in the, in the strategy, we believe as, as Hans uh, said earlier that there is a win-win-win or there could be a win-win-win, that it's not only about trade-off, that, not, uh, that in the, it's not because there are high prices that there will be innovation, or it's not necessarily because there are high prices that there will be innovation, or that innovation is not necessarily happening because there are high prices or that um, access does not necessarily either means high prices. We also believe that it's important to talk about what we are accessing, what are the products that are on the shelves. If the products that are on the shelves are only to a limited extent better than what is already available, maybe they, they can stay on the shelves. So it's not everything that needs to be accessed. I think we need to reintroduce this idea uh, and a certain number of ideas. This is why we believe that um, uh, multi-stakeholder cooperation is key. And this is something we have a, a tradition uh, of organizing um, in the European Union and, and, and as the European Commission. And we think this is a very important uh, issue. But another important dimension we're also highlighting in, in the way we work now on this uh, pharmaceutical strategy that it is about cooperation between across the public authorities, between authorities that are involved in the pharmaceutical uh, life cycle, that we um, break the silos that have existed too long between the, the so-called regulators that would only be looking at safety and efficacy and, um, and, and quality, 
the, those that are looking at the cost effectiveness through HGA bodies, those that are looking at pricing and reimbursement and negotiating that uh, also based on uh, uh, therapeutic added value or other types of criteria related to that for the price setting. And of course, those that are ultimately using uh, the medicines with their patients, so the health professionals and the, the uh, health systems. Uh, and uh, so it has to be, all this has to be looked at as a continuum of public authorities that probably need to be working together also across, as they all usually report to the same government, they also need to be setting a way forward together so that decisions that are taken by the regulators don't unnecessarily affect the possibility for uh, the payers to negotiate prices that lead to a proper access and vice versa. So it's all the way the system should work. And we, we're trying to emphasize that and we want to um, uh, promote that type of cooperation across administration and administrative bodies. So uh, it is indeed uh, a breakthrough uh, that this strategy uh, is now looking at affordability. Uh, this concept of affordability, and I don't need to refer to what the problem is. I think it was very well explained by Dr. Larsen uh, from the point of view of Norway. And, and, and as, as people often say, if Norway has a problem, it's, it surely is a problem. Um, so here, um, it, we, 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 there is a, a, the problem is there. I mean, the challenge is there. What is new, I think, in the context of the EU is that we've now recognized together collectively, the member states and the European institution, that contrary to what has been said for many years, that this is not an EU level issue, it's purely a national issue, that, that is not true. Uh, we need to be working on this issue together, not necessarily through legislation, because this is not something that where we want to harmonize the, uh, the national situations, but where there is a lot to learn from each other. There is a lot of instruments that are experienced in some countries that could be replicated, of course, in full respect of the national situation, the national tradition, the national, the organization of the health systems, all these are different and they should remain different if it's the, as it is the political will of the, the leaders and, and the peoples of Europe, probably. But we, there's a lot to learn as well. And this is what we want from the European Commission to, to generate through uh, the usual instruments we have to in, in cooperation between between national actors, uh, but also through uh, a revision of the basic uh, legislative framework that we have at EU level for uh, EU products. We believe that by revising certain of the provisions that are there, we will also be able to affect or to impact on a better affordability, a better availability uh, and better quality, but that we want to do all these and pursue these objectives together and holistically. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Sylvain. And I think uh, um, we have been left in no doubt that uh, the European Union and WHO Regional Office for Europe really share a common vision and common objectives and are trying to see how um, this complex area can be taken forward, really bringing the member states and the non-state actors and the industry um, together. We have a couple of questions already from our audience in the chat. And perhaps I would like to um, give this first question first to Elizabeth. We have a question asking, but in practice, basically, how can we align the incentives of all the different stakeholders? What would you, your um, perhaps top two recommendations, Elizabeth, be in terms of seeking incentive alignment when it is quite clear that the different stakeholders do really sit um, uh, across uh, the table from different perspectives? But is it possible to talk about aligning incentives? What would you say? Um, and then afterwards, I would like also to hear from your, Bjorn Inge, his perspective on whether the alignment of incentives is something that is really possible. So Elizabeth, if I can come to you first. Yeah, absolutely, Natasha. Many thanks for this question, because I think this is the key question uh, to tackle. And I think perhaps a starting point for me would be really to say like, we need to strike a balance between indeed um, access to medicines, innovation and industrial development. 
because it really their policies need to be aligned because of course, we need to have sustainable health systems and, and sustainable European-based uh, research uh, innovation-driven industry, because one is not really possible without the other. So really a holistic value um, assessment and a value approach in that respect is needed, because I think only a focus on cost containment and driving down prices will not provide the necessary incentives for, for the industry. On the other end, of course, it's really important that, that society, health systems and payers need to be reassured that they're getting value for money. I think that's really important. And I think the key to that for me would really be to have uh, more data available to really work on the collection of data needed to monitor the effectiveness of medicines in real life. And in that respect, I think the, the point calibration and capacity building it is really of great value. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Bjorn Inge, from your perspective, is alignment of incentives something that we can really aspire to achieve? Well, uh, thank you, Natasha. Um, I, I think it's very important for us to, um, to find that out. I, be I believe it can. I think, um, I think in some instances today, we see industry uh, setting extremely high prices. Uh, and then reaching out to quite small patient groups. And um, I think there must be um, an alternative way forward where, where much broader patient groups are getting access to good treatments uh, and that <clears throat> industry is making money based on volume and not only, or, or and <clears throat> at the same time, uh, reduced uh, prices. And I, and I think uh, some of the things that we will do in the Oslo Medicines Initiative is is actually to see if there is uh, possible to find uh, common ground on this and and maybe even to understand if uh, because I'm, I'm very happy to hear that the industry uh, is so clear and definitive and that they would also like to achieve real access uh, for patients now so so of course the price level of course is one of the key elements uh, when 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 uh, real access is not achieved uh, and I think if you look through Europe uh, and also outside of outside of Europe and, and look at the level of access, uh, you will find countries that give access to drugs. They decide to use the drugs. But of course, every hospital has budgets. So in reality, the drug is not used by all the patients that could actually benefit uh, from them. Uh, Norway has another approach, like the British approach. Um, when we decide to take uh, a drug into use, it will be used for all the patients that will benefit from the drug. It will not be up to the, to the individual doctor or the individual hospital to decide on, on their uh, practice. So, so here you will find countries across Europe that have different um, approach on this. And I think this is also the question to uh, Boris, who has uh, asked me uh, a question, um, the answer to, to Boris that asked me a question. There is a difference between giving access and the number of patients that actually get the access. Access. So, and and the last time that I saw FPA publishing statistics, and it's quite a few years back, publishing statistics on uh, how how well is actually the penetration of medicines into the different countries uh, and markets. So at that time, when even though Norway was saying no to a large number of the new high-priced medicines, we still had the highest penetration of the innovative high drugs uh, in our country, Be because when we first decide to use a drug, we find the cost uh, to be beneficial uh, relative to the effect, then everyone gets it in our health service. So, so these are slightly different approaches that country takes and, and it might look different when you look at statistics or decisions in countries. But in reality, the, the challenge of patients not getting the drugs that they would benefit from, that is a that is a challenge in every country, also in Europe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bjorn Inge, and Thank you for also addressing the second question in the chat. We have time, perhaps just to very briefly take one last question and I'll come to Sylvain on the, uh, what the EU thinks about equity-based tier pricing. So just a very briefly, a last question from Sylvain before transitioning then to the second part of our panel. Equity-based 
health pricing? Is that the question? Equity based, equity based tiered pricing. So oh, I have to say that, uh, this is I'm not able to answer this question right now. In just a few minutes, I think we need to um, to discuss what the, that actually means. Uh, uh, what, what 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 I can say is that you know we have now relaunched the cooperation between the national competent authorities on pricing and reimbursement, and we've had a group. And what we want to do in this group is. Uh, we, we've clarified around three three words: stability, stability of the membership, to so provide these authorities with a place where they can discuss um, continu continuity um, through um, uh, agenda planning that the Commission and the presidencies in the European Union are developing. And that's where I come to your question: concreteness. So we want this group to be. Uh, uh, providing experts at national level uh, the opportunity to be discussing uh, new models of pricing, new models of contracting, new models of uh, procurement in a way that uh, practices that are developing in different countries and that some have been successful, some have not been successful, and they can be looked at and define the uh, success factors, the criteria and so on. And if there is a, a need for a common guidelines or common approaches, they can be developed. But the idea is uh, to start very much by providing these authorities with a framework where they can develop their national policy making. It's not necessarily about an EU level policy on these issues, but that member states authorities have the possibility to develop their national policy making. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you very much. And of course, uh, the network is a very also important network, and I'm sure there will be ample room for continued collaboration, even with the Oslo Medicines Initiative and the work that is being done by the PPRI. And this brings me to close our first political segment. Thank you very much, Hans, uh, Bjorning, Elizabeth, and Sylvain for being with us here this morning and kicking off. And now we transition to the more technical part, and it is my pleasure to hand the floor over to Warden. Thank you very much, Natasha. The title of this second uh, part uh, is The Mission Ahead, Exploring Emerging Ideas. Uh, and first, I would like to introduce Sarah Garner, who works at the WHO Regional Office for Europe as a program manager of the Health Technologies and Pharmaceutical Program. Sarah has a broad and extensive experience regarding innovation and the interface between HTA regulation and payers, and have among many important positions also held a central position in NICE. Sarah, you are also very central in the work with OMI, and you will now update us on the outcomes of the consultation so far. Please, Sarah. Great, thank you very much, Alden, for the introduction um, and for the opportunity um, of speaking to you all this morning. Um, I've got a very short time this morning, so I'm just going to give you a flavour of the progress we've made to date and also a sneak preview of the themes that we've seen coming through um, the consultation exercise. Um, so we've started with our first consultation with member states and the non-state actors that we've identified who are working at a European level. Um, we held a series, two, two consultation exercises um, where we put to our consultees a series of questions. And again, we, the previous um, se session has highlighted how OMI is attempting to be very um, project orientated to really identify solutions. Um, we can talk about the problems, we can talk about who's to blame for the problems, but we need to move forward and that needs solutions identifying and new ways of working, which is where OMI is fairly unique um, amongst initiatives. We're now working through um, a series of stakeholder engagement exercises to really hear in depth um, from all the interested parties. We held um, a meeting at the regional committee um, to update our member states. WHO is a member state led organization. So we updated member states on progress. And then we're moving into the second phase um, of the Oslo Medicines Initiative, um, building up to a high level meeting in June, 2022. Um, over the next coming months, we're going to be launching a series of 11 background documents um, that really drive down um, into some of the complex technical areas. Hans has alluded to this. Um, we need to have a discussion on the political level 
um, but also on the technical level as this are very complex um, issues. Um, and then um, we'll be also be hosting a series of webinars to look at these issues in detail. Um, breaking from tradition, these are going to be um, open webinars and we will be um, putting details on the WHO website um, so anyone can register for those webinars. Um, and again, very much focused on solutions. And then as we move forward to the high level meeting in June 2022, we'll be going to do a second set of member state and non-state actor consultations um, to really look at where we are um, with the detail and then seek agreements on what we can do um, going forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to give you a sneak um, preview um, of some of the themes that we heard um, in the consultation exercises. This is not an exhaustive list. This is not a closed list. This is just merely um, to give you a hint um, of, of the direction that our stakeholders and member states um, see us going in. Um, number one is transparency. Um, again, how can we implement um, WHA 72.8, which is a transparency resolution, um, looking at not only price, but other factors um, in the pharmaceutical value chain. Um, responsibility came through, social responsibility, um, and that's responsibilities of industry, um, governments and civil society. Um, we have three different communities talking very different languages at the moment. Um, one of business, um, one of policy, um, and one of access and ethics. So we need to bring those three um, together, agree on how we get where we need to get to, and then have commitments to which we're all held accountable. Metrics became important, so how are we measuring progress? And then also systems um, approach. This is a, a very complex system. Um, we focus a lot on price, but we cannot disentang disentangle it from other aspects of that system. So for example, um, the regulatory um, decision-making paradigm drives quite a lot um, the indications and also um, the clinical data um, that is available. So we, need, we have a lot of dedicated partners um, in this system and we need to work together to identify roles and responsibilities. Um, we have many tools and resources that have not been implemented. We've had agreements that have not been implemented. How can we um, improve uptake? Um, and particularly um, for our non-EU uh, member states in the WHO Euro family, um, we need to capacity strength um, and, and get them really up to speed um, on how to manage these complex um, discussions. Um, we need a platform, OMI is providing that platform, um, but we realise that some of these competencies are member state competencies um, that need, and the discussions need to be held at a national level as well as, well as a sub-national, sub-regional um, and regional level um, and even a global level. Um, and we're not going to tackle this problem if we deal with all of the, either of those in isolation. And finally, getting really complex. We need working groups to explore the feasibility of policy solutions, um, joint projects, and then resource mobilization to be able to um, um, resource, both human resources and financial resources, um, to be able to move forwards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the technical part. Um, um, these are the, the, we've been talking about access to high cost medicines. So there's been a lot of focus on um, incentives, pricing and payment models. Um, again, um, I just want to highlight that this is a systems approach. We cannot look at pricing um, in isolation without talking about incentives and business models um, and also costs of research and development, um, business structures. So it, it, we need to really think holistically about this problem um, if we're going to solve it. Um, and then finally, um, I'm not going to go through these in detail. Um, these have all been suggested, the next bullet point, secretary-based tiered pacing, ex the role of external reference pricing, value-based pricing minus um, new payment models, um, and then pool procurement initiatives include a greater role for price volume um, arrangements. So I'm not going to go through those in detail, each of those as a thesis um, in itself. Um, the final two, Alden, I just want to highlight out of here, 
um, are the role of non-price incentives, so other incentives that are provided um, by health systems and member state systems towards um, innovation, and then the difference globally that we've got with the different health system models um, and how initiatives that might be appropriate in a private insurance model um, where costs, uh, medicine costs are higher, may, ha may have um, different implications for the tax funded models that we see so much um, in the European region. Um, and again, um, one of our key areas of focus will be um, the non-EU member states as well. This is a this is an extremely important debate um, for the EU member states, but we also have um, non-EU member states, um, lower middle income countries, and, and we hope that they can learn from the debates that we're having so we can support them with the development of sustainable um, healthcare systems. And Alden, thank you. I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for this uh, great overview of uh, what we've achieved so far. And as you all can see, there's a very broad process leading up to the high level meeting next year in the OMI. Before we move on to the panel discussion, we will have a second round of polling questions. That's fun. And this time the question is, which of the key enablers do you see most potential in? And you can tick more than one of the above uh, options. So please give your answers now and we will follow it carefully. The alternatives are new platform to enable collaboration or metrics to measure patient access or social responsibilities of private, public, and civil sector, civil society sectors, or increasing transparency. Uh, or finally, I think a different enable, uh, enabler is crucial. And then you need to tell us more about that in the chat. Okay, pretty equal distribution so far. Maybe uh, it's, it changes, it changes. <laughs> pretty, pretty equal. I think we can, we can uh, stop here. Um, Jan, you say that multiple answer doesn't work. At least in my Slido, I could only tick one box. So okay, don't think okay. that you have a multiple answer from your audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but could, could we get the results back on the screen, please? Because we have to... Okay, what came out on top is increasing transparency as the key enabler to um, which we see most potentially in, but, but it, it was a close call social responsibilities, new platform, metrics, all seems to be important. Okay, we will now move on to the panel discussions around the questions, what does transparency, solidarity and sustainability mean to you? What concrete actions can you as stakeholders take forward? And while the panelists, uh, they might chew on the results of the poll and the implications it might have on their answers. While they do that, I would like to introduce the rest of the members of this distinguished panel for you. We have Jens Gruger. He is a director and partner at Boston Consulting Group based in Zurich, where he is a senior expert for pricing and market access in healthcare. Jens has a long and distinguished career in the industry, working with pricing and reimbursement for several major companies. And today, he will cover the technical pricing perspective for us. Jo de Kock has until very recently been the head of the National Institute of Health and Disability Insurance in Belgium, and for many years. But this summer, he retired and has become a pensioner at least for a few days before he was uh, now has joined OMI as a special advisor. So nice try. 
Joe has definitely experience from the payer perspective, but today he will also talk about the cross-country collaboration and horizon scanning. And to cover the industry perspective, we have Thomas Alvin, who is Director for Strategy and Healthcare Systems at the European Industry Associations, FPA, where he mainly works with policies for more sustainable outcomes-based systems, including facilitating access to health data needed for future healthcare models. And last, but definitely not least, Jan Le Cam. He has definitely a background that enables him to cover the patient perspective. Jan was one of the founders of Eurodis Rare Disease Europe, the alliance of rare disease patient organizations that work together to improve the lives of the 30 million people living with rare diseases in Europe. He has been heading the organizations for more than 20 years now. Dear audience, please use uh, the chat functions to actively add your questions and ideas, especially if you see any other solutions that could improve access to high-priced medicines in Europe. Um, and dear panelists, time is short and I can only give you three minutes each. So please start out with what you think is absolutely most important in case I have to cut in. First, Jan, since you're in the picture, I would like to give the floor, the floor to you. And uh, transparency, solidarity, sustainability, that's large words. It's big words. They can have big very words, different, big words very to different kill. meanings depending on who you ask. So what do you mean? What do they mean to you in the context of OMI, please? For us, on transparency first, I would like to insist that in our perspective, it's not transparency on the price, but transparency on the process on making the decision. In terms of metrics, delays of access for patients, number of patients treated in each country, but also important to us, the patient experience regarding access to medicine. So to ask the patient themselves, we're doing that regularly and it gives a, a comp an additional perspective. Solidarity, I would insist that from our perspective, it's not about being charitable or generous. Solidarity means, and is here in particular to recognize and name that we have a common interest and a mutual interest. And here the common interest is to provide access to patients for transformative and curative therapies that science is bringing us at the moment, which are today innovative products and too often they are just cannot be rich to patients and we have that every day at the moment with new treatments and the second common interest is to have the best value for money that we're paying through or taxes and uh, salary charges but the mutual interest is that we need to have data and evidence generated in uh, from the other countries in order to inform the decision in our country and second, to aggregate or power purchase or bargaining power to play the volume in order to have the optimal price while providing a predictable revenue. Now, sustainability, and I close there. So the main point I will make here is risk sharing and linking research and access. Thank you so much. Very interesting, Jan. And then, then I have the same questions uh, to you, Jens. Transparency, solidarity, sustainability. What do you think? What are your perspectives? Thank you very much, Alden, and thanks for the invitation to this uh, interesting meeting. I want to start with the topic of solidarity and social responsibility. Solidarity in the context of medicine prices means that industry should offer and countries should accept to pay prices in line with the economic situation in the respective countries. In simple terms, prices in Portugal should probably be lower than those in Germany, and those in Romania should be even lower. You can then ask how much lower, and there is no perfect answer. But there are suggestions like linking prices, relative price ranges uh, to GDP per capita, perhaps adjusted for purchasing power parity and uh, indicators of health spending. In the context of this initiative, we could propose principles and relative ranges for innovative medicine pricing across countries. And when companies are following this and make products available within these relative price ranges, there should be some form of protection from reference pricing or trade 
which is unfortunately a major barrier in Europe for equitable differentiated pricing of medicines. In fact, I have seen that many biopharmaceutical companies are already trying to implement such principles of, equ of equity-based differential pricing, but because of concerns around international reference pricing and trade, they have implemented this at the net price level, which is typically confidential rather than through transparent list prices. I have found that a country like Italy has probably been most successful in this respect. They started in 2006 with a web-based registry that allows them to implement various forms of financial and performance-based marriage entry agreements and that has significantly accelerated access for innovative medicines and a higher proportion of innovative medicines are now available in Italy than in many other countries that do not offer such mechanisms. Of course, we still need to assess absolute price ranges for costly medicines. I believe that we have robust processes in the majority of countries that are based on systematic assessment of a wide range of benefits for patients, their families and caregivers, health systems and societies as a whole. And we already have European mechanisms in place through UNETA to conduct the scientific assessment at a European level, which can improve the quality and speed of such assessments and reduce duplication and conflicting recommendations. Pricing is and should remain a country responsibility, but if there are transparent principles that inform price ranges between countries, this would facilitate such negotiations and lead to prices that reflect affordability and are sustainable both for health systems and for industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jens. And uh, uh, tiered pricing, it is uh, a special question. You touch upon the three pillars, one of the three pillars in the EU with free flow of goods, but uh, let's discuss it. It's uh, interesting. Okay, then we move over to you. Transparency, solidarity, sustainability. Please. Yo. Thank you, uh, Arden. Of course, these are philosophical, philosophical questions in uh, one way, but nevertheless, they have very concrete, they need very concrete answers. And it's for everybody, I think, very clear that these three principles are interlinked and, uh, of course, uh, are <clears throat> uh, composing one holistic and need one holistic uh, view. Transparency is a hot topic, and I think uh, we should avoid pointless discussions uh, about pricing levels or accounting exercises. As was said, I think I agree that, uh, of course, the pricing process transparency and the pricing as such uh, are two different uh, elements of the coin. But nevertheless, pricing uh, transparency is not a unidirectional issue. It's a bidirectional issue. It's not only an issue is coming from industry to member states, but it's also um, uh, um, signals which are coming out from society. Society cannot be acting anymore as a so-called blind payer, but has to act as an active buyer who makes long-term choices, define clear priorities to decide on and to allocate financial resources over a long time and should be an investor in health outcomes and health status. I think that's a, a, paradigm, a paradigm shift, which is, of course, uh, aligned with the, with the change we see in the pharmaceutical market, which was evolved from a blockbuster to a niche buster industry. Solidarity, it was mentioned by Jens, but um, how, do, how do you organize? How do we organize in practice that nobody will have behind an access to truly innovative medicines. We see in different studies that the PPP adjusted prices for several cancer products are higher and are higher in lower co income countries as in, in higher income countries. This is not possible. And we see that this gap is widening. This gap is widening. We have to act now. And probably we have to reflect on uh, innovative payment models. Um, there was uh, equity-based fiat pricing was already mentioned, and uh, we should, um, I think, also analyze other uh, pricing models. But since uh, this um, access and solidarity is becoming a global challenge, I think a global approach is needed and collaboration between countries is therefore essential. Different networks are already in place. We know them all, Beneluxa, Valletta, the Nordics, 
And we are demonstrating added value of capacity and expertise building. This was also mentioned, capacity building, exchange of information, regardless of national specificities. And we have to launch uh, where possible also, and to think about launching common procurement where needed as the vaccination strategy has proved. I think WHO and the OMI can play an active role by supporting these initiatives. And finally, sustainability. Sustainability, the COVID crisis has clearly shown that preparedness is a key issue for our health systems. This is also true for pharmaceutical policies. And in this regard, I would um, uh, um, refer to one interesting initiative. It's the International Horizon Scanning Initiative in which eight countries, six, 73 million citizens are working together to address the issues they face. And they aim specially to promote fair and transparent, transparent pharmaceutical prices to use data to realize affordable prices, to mitigate the impact of disruptive in innovation confronted as we are with gene therapies and curing technologies. Uh, uh, the uh, International Horizon Scanning uh, Initiative will have an um, uh, um, a seminar, I think, in November, and we, they will produce high impact reports, which can be of great importance for the different member states, both in the European Union as in the WHO European region. It will allow to improve access, potential for savings, enabled collaboration. And I think it's a point of starting early dialogues in order to um, respond to these three challenges which is our transparency, solidarity, and of course, sustainability. I thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Jo. And then we move quickly over to Thomas, please. Thank you, uh, Orden, and, and I think a great discussion and many good things have already been said. I, I, I think I would like to start by, uh, by saying, going back to Sarah's presentation, that yes, we need a systems approach. And access to medicines doesn't happen in a vacuum. They take place in health systems, and it's all about how they are, how they are functioning, uh, how they are financed, pricing, reimbursement system. Um, so, so I think that's very important. You know, looking at transparency, um, I think actually in the in the poll questions, I would I would sort of link the transparency issue also to the metric system because the, the issue of metrics is about creating more transparency about what's actually happening in the different countries in Europe. And, and, uh, and here I think we, we can make a lot of progress and knowing more about the situation will also stimulate the solutions. And Elizabeth already mentioned the, the FBI weight indicator and our current work on getting more granular uh, data on which medicines are actually launched where and why they are not and get more transparency around market access hurdles. And as other have, have, have said, the pricing models used and how are decisions taken? I think we can do a lot more uh, here. And also on Joe's point, on preparedness to know more about the R&D pipelines. So also there, FBI is yearly publishing a pipeline review to give an overview of breakthrough innovation that is coming in the next few years, because this is about uh, preparedness. Um, on solidarity, uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we clearly have an innovation model that is working and that is producing a lot of uh, high breakthrough therapies. Um, I think that when, when we see access in Europe some, and, 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 and we see these uh, huge differences between different countries in, in delays to innovative medicines, uh, there we need uh, solidarity. And Sarah, uh, on, 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 on your slides, uh, you know, you talked about equity-based tier pricing, external reference pricing, how, how, how is this system working? So there is already links between countries and, and as was said, you know, uh, Romania should have a lower price than say Switzerland. That takes solidarity and that takes uh, a joint discussion, which you can never solve in just a dialogue between one company and one country in, 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 in about one particular drug. Um, so, so, so I think that's, that's hugely important. On uh, uh, sustainability, uh, again, I think it's very positive that the Oslo Medicines Initiative talks about both sustainable health systems and a sustainable industry. Because again, we need, we need each other. Uh, and, and without sustainable health systems, there will not be a sustainable industry. Uh, but also the industry and the innovation pr pr 
provided also helps create sustainable health systems. As we see the COVID-19 vaccines keep people out of hospital and, 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 and you see this across different therapy areas, diabetes, cardiovascular, actually help save money for health systems by avoiding unnecessary emergency visits, hospitalization. So, so we, we need to see this as a system. And, and uh, so we need to, to base this on, on the value-based approach. To go back to also what Sylvain said, uh, what's the value of the medicines? Uh, how do we assess this? Uh, uh, so, so we can square this circle. And, and, and I think absolutely looking into these novel payment models that were men mentioned, because some of them, you know, nothing is a silver bullet, but some of them contain some of the answers for how to introduce some of these, uh, for instance, new cell and gene therapies that comes with a very high upfront uh, cost, but will hope, hopefully save money in the long run. How do we, how do, we do with that? And, and I think here, also, as Savan talked about more collaboration between countries, but also stakeholders, because of course the industry has a lot of experience in how to do this, and and I think we need to learn of these good practices, and and maybe through this initiative, help with capacity building, so that all countries in the European region can have benefit from this. Can we start a, a little round of follow-up questions here? And I'm really after the concrete uh, actions and the concrete obligations. And let's focus on sustainability. And let, let's stick with you, Thomas. You talked about this um, model where we both can cater sustainable health systems with access to innov innovative medicines and at the same time, the sustainable uh, pharma industry incentivized for continuous R&D. In your opinion, is this doable with a win-win-win through dialogue or is it just an elusive utopia? And if you think it's doable, what are the concrete obligations? No, I think it's 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 absolutely doable, and 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 it has to be doable, and and I think that and 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 the baseline and why why it uh, why it will work is because as as we already said, you know, both uh, industry, patients, health systems want access to medicines for all patients that need them. I mean, no one has an interest of a medicine just being on the shelf except as, as Sylvain said, maybe it wasn't a good medicine, but, but you know, for all beneficial medicines that, that actually create a value, we all have a common interest in doing this, but we need to, to come back to an earlier question, align the incentives. We need mm -hmm. to have an environment in the European region where, uh, where, where, where you don't have cross-functional uh, incentives. And, and this comes back to the issue of external reference pricing, equity-based tiered pricing. If, if uh, you know, more access in, in, uh, in a country like, like Romania creates a disincentive for the industry, then, then we have a problem. And that's why we need to talk about these things together. And right. we can do that uh, and we can solve it. Thank you, Thomas. Um, you mentioned, Jens, that, um, tier based pricing is important, but then Yo claimed that the current situation is just opposite, that the richest countries are paying the least. So how do we fix this very concrete? Jens, please. I'm not aware that uh, this is a frequent situation. It may happen from time to time, um, but it is definitely something if we think about metrics that we should be exploring in there. And I think that would be something where I would expect from industry that they also make certain commitments in there and that could be audited in there I and mean, they don't have to disclose all the prices but we can equally think about um, a, a, a regular review that could be organized by FPA or uh, some other industry association to say that in what proportion of, uh, of uh, medicine prices um, has industry achieved this kind of monotonous relationship that countries with a higher um, uh, economic ability are actually paying higher prices. I mean, that's a simple exercise in there. It would be extremely interesting to see how frequent this problem is. In my time in the industry, I am aware of some situations. They were usually linked to the breadth of reimbursement. It may happen that one country, that a higher income country provides broad access and then requests a lower price than another country that only reimburses the very severe patients, but then at a slightly higher price. But in generally, when you keep the conditions 
constant. I believe that industry is already close to kind of, uh, establishing this monotonous, monotonous relationship. Thank you, Jens. Uh, Jan, um, we've now been discussing pricing technicalities, but from the patient perspective, do you believe in this dialogue? Do you think we can achieve this or is it uh, too elusive? Please. It was quite, it is quite elusive. It's 10 years that we're discussing it. We started with the presidency of Belgium in 2009. Look how many products have been negotiated today. You just want to cry. It's, it's wonderful. No, I mean, it's wonderful because there is a will. There is the Nordic countries trying. There is the Beneluxa, which is a great progress. But all that is far too slow. And we want to see more act. And really what we're putting on the table is a proposal for the very rare diseases. It should be a no brainer than when there are only few patients across Europe, often evenly distributed across the countries that we should collaborate at the European level to do the joint assessment and to do the pooling of, of the negotiation and to decide on which centers they should be cured and to agree on how to provide cross-border access. Today, we are proving with the marketing authorization fantastic products which are potentially transformative or curative coming from the innovation, coming from the investment, and we're just a failure. And we will continue to be a full disaster if we continue like that. We have stories now every month of such dramas, of patients dying because they don't have access, or companies pulling off of Europe because the market is not organized. So what we're saying is that we need an ecosystem which is con a conducive environment, but we need a system approach with technical solution. And for me, the key problem is not differential pricing. We fully support it and since years. That's not the point. The point is evidence generation. Evidence generation. If I have to hammer something, it's evidence generation. This is where we need to be organized because the full issue is that it's good enough to go for marketing authorization, but it's not good enough for anyone to base decisions with high uncertainties. And that's fair to say, there is limited knowledge. So the only way to address that is to pull or limited knowledge or limited data or limited number of patients and limited money at the European level to discuss the value, to discuss how we reduce these uncertainties and discuss how we transform this value assessment into a price, which today is a fraud, it doesn't work. So to do that, we're calling for a table of negotiation of the member states. Now that we have the HTA regulation in Europe, where every advanced therapies, every cancer therapy, and soon every orphan drugs will go through joint assessment, then we should accept first to do not only joint assessment, but also reassessment. Two, to discuss together the uncertainties and the path of reducing these uncertainties. And we have the system in place with the European research networks and with all the money coming from the health uh, digital agenda. So we can align upstream EMA, HTA industry on the registries, have registries qualified by EMA, have patient reported outcome qualified, have centers of care submitted the specifications and which data should be collected by the hospital in these centers submitted to CHMP because it's important for quality, for efficacy, but also for HD assessment. And then based on that, to have EU funds, and I hope that Sylvain would agree to that, to have EU funds coming in as an incentive to pay for the generation of additional evidence post-marketing. It is still a research activity. That's the incentive to get both industry and member states around the table for these therapies. And then we can have joint procurement. Then we can go for tier pricing and maybe payment over time and payment on outcomes. But there is no payment no. on outcomes if you don't collect the data properly. <laughs> Thank you very much. for your, you, you have at least clear advices. That's very good. Uh, now, um, I'm again inviting the audience to actively add your input and ideas in the chat. Um, and we have some questions. What are the main drivers of high income countries saying no to innovative drugs apart from high price? It can be, for instance, weak evidence base, like you touch upon, uh, Jan, um, or an HTA submission that isn't in line with payer expectations. What do we know about the relative importance of price? Maybe Jens, do you have some evidence in this? 
I mean, the first point is that um, just looking at income levels in countries does not uh, uh, paint the full picture. Uh, countries have different political decisions. Um, a country like the UK spends less on healthcare than Germany or France. And as a consequence of that, uh, there are also certain medicines that uh, cannot be um, afforded in the UK that are available in Germany and France. And we have seen these things um, uh, in the cancer space uh, in, in other areas. So I, I think uh, that these are partly also national decisions uh, to say that um, um, we want to prioritize certain disease areas and not others. And um, the question is, to what extent uh, does industry have to follow these things or um, uh, is it up to the up to the up to the countries in that uh, case to say no? I mean, we would rather not want to reimburse these medicines because we see more value to our population in other um, uh, in in other technologies. Thank you. And Sarah, you're part of the panel too, and you please go ahead. <laughs> um, thank you, Alden. Um, I just wanted to come in. Um, on that, um, as someone who spent early in my career, spent many years looking at these submissions, um, it's multifactorial. Um, the, there's, there's some reasons around um, political decisions, there's some reasons around funding. Um, but if we're looking at Jan's brave new world that he outlined, um, we, we've got a tightrope between early access and evidence. So we're making decisions at the very start of our knowledge about um, the performance of these drugs in, they've been tried in very select patient groups, we're now using the population, many um, complicating factors there. Um, and that the problem we've had um, is that they're being introduced with a very binary system um, whereby it's yes or no, and there hasn't been a system in place where we can share that uncertainty explicitly. Um, both on the responsibilities around um, evidence generation, but then also on costs. Um, and that's something that all stakeholders have to have that shared vision um, and negotiate the roles and responsibilities. And then we can manage that period, um, that sort of the early five years, if you like, where we're learning about both on-label and off-label, um, what those new therapies achieve. And our, our systems are just not geared up to do that um, and that's something that we, we need to talk about um, and so rather than the health systems um, implicitly um, having all the burden that we now explicitly share it between us. Back to you. Thank you Sarah. Unfortunately time is running out uh, and uh, I guess Natasha it's uh, time for some closing remarks here and the main question now is perhaps is there sufficient common ground to move forward on the OMI platform to obtain better access? And from the discussion today and what we've heard, I, I think the answer is, is a yes. We can move forward here and should move forward. What is your opinion? Over to you, Natasha. Thank you, Odin, and thank you um, everyone for, I think, really a very frank, open and civil discussion that we have seen in the past answer. And uh, um, without wanting to, to paraphrase perhaps one of the popular TV shows that my key teenage kids like to watch, the answer from me is also a yes. And we hope that we can get a full house of yeses also from the industry and from the representatives of the patient associations it's not an easy road, but I think what we are hearing is that we need to move forward. We need to unravel and we need to move forward. And one of the things I think that is really clear, also um, building on what Jan said, um, when it comes, for example, to evidence, to reports, I think we need to look um, very much also at getting agreement on the type of reports that we need to produce on what we actually want to measure. Because one of the difficulties in shaping a unique narrative is that I think we have all been busy producing reports from our perspectives, which say often very different things. So maybe this um, for me has also been my take home message. I know some time ago, Odin, you were in a meeting with us where we were talking also about metrics and the complexity 
But even perhaps a step before that, it's even about the type of reports that we want to produce. What do we want to focus on? And is it possible to have a better shared understanding and do more joint work in this area? Still plenty to do and time is running out because we launched a year ago and I think we have nine months now to really cut to the chase. So my parting message would be, please continue to be engaged with us. Please come forward. We would like to hear from you. And perhaps here we can also leave you with a series of parting questions with which our colleagues from the EHFG will present and an open-ended question that really allows you all to continue to reflect and interact with us. In your view, which other solutions that haven't been mentioned or of the ones that have been mentioned over the past 90 minutes would be the ones that you think are most promising for us in order to make progress at two levels. Yes, at the political level, it would be great if we can agree on common language and sign a common declaration and have a meeting statement from the high level meeting in Oslo in June. But as we heard at our press point early this morning that was addressed by the regional director and other high level speakers, declarations that remain on paper are also not worth their while are not sufficient. So what we need to do is we need to get the results of those declarations into our health systems to make a difference for patients. Thank you all very much for joining us and please stay with us along this journey. Wishing you a great week ahead.